Hi, this short video is just uh, put together to help you understand how uh, CPM is calculated. Uh, in chapter three of the textbook, I go through uh, how a critical path method is calculated. This little example here is animated, so I think it's a little bit easier for you um, to follow the process and get an idea or sense how software programs calculate the, the critical path. This little example here was actually a number of years ago we collaborated uh, Ali Vasali from LS Don and myself and putting together a whole bunch of uh, materials for LS Don and this little video here uh, the animations really sort of gets the point across through um, his genius with uh, PowerPoint I guess you could say. Um, so uh, first uh, as we mentioned uh, in the chapter 3 we have to have a full and complete understanding of the activities that are involved and um, oops, uh, the activities that we need to uh, utilize. Uh, so we've got them listed here and we've got basically the durations and the predecessors. You would need to have all of that figured out and then the network diagram, if all of that is figured out and applied, those activities uh, then uh, are listed and uh, if we click uh, step by step, it's just basically putting in the predecessors and successors that was on the previous slide uh, to show all the connections. And if we look at that, what do you see is not correct there? Can you see that? Do you see a problem right there? Take a good look. What would not be a good situation? What would not be following best practices? If you caught that flooring, does not have a successor activity, then you would be correct. So basically, flooring does does not have a, a successor uh, activity, so we'd want to have that included in there. Now that's better. It's not an open end. Before it was an open end without it. Uh, once we place that in there, it is connected and all of the network is complete. Uh, very important. So now if we're starting our project, you would assume that you're starting now so you could put the early start date as being zero and that would be the start of the project and then we would basically take uh, our duration of 10 and we would add that uh, to uh, the zero so that gives us an early finish of 10. So now the easy thing is to just say all right so now the early finish of M and E roughen becomes the early start of stud and board side. And right now we're working on the forward pass. So remember we have to do the forward pass and the backward pass. So I'm assuming that you've uh, reviewed chapter three of the textbook and so you have a good concept of that. Then basically on the forward pass, the 10 becomes the early start for stud and board one side. We add the duration, which is five days. So 10 plus 5 is going to be 15, and 10 plus 8 is going to be 18. So we can see over here, 10 plus 8, that gives us our early finish. And over here, the early finish became the early start, plus 7 gives us 22. The 22 goes in to become the early start, plus 6 becomes 28 days. Now, uh, over here too, we see that the 18 becomes the early start, plus 4, 22. And if you recall in the chapter where activities merge on the forward pass, which one do we take? Do we take as the early start our uh, 15 or do we take the 18? Because really what this is saying, if we remember what we said about predecessors, is this has to be done and this has to be done before we start the flooring. If that's true, then we have to wait for the 18 days. So we take the larger number on the forward pass where successors merge. So in this case, that would be 18. And we're going to take 18 plus 14, and that's going to give us our early finish. So the 32 over here is, is there. We've got uh, merging activities again. We've got 28 and we've got 22. So again, logically, which number would we take? We would take again the larger number right, which is the 32, and that becomes our early start. So early start plus four is gonna give us our early finish, which is 36. So that's the forward pass complete, and we now know that this project is gonna take 36 days from when we start it to when we complete it. 
So once the forward pass is done, we are going to do the backward pass. Because remember with the backward pass, when we have that complete, then we can figure out which activities uh, are on the critical path, the ones that have zero float, and how much float do the other activities have? How much flexibility do the other activities have? So we know if the last activity on our, on our schedule is 36 days long, and that's the earliest we can finish, because we know that has to be on the critical path, it's also gonna be the late finish. So that 36 days then becomes the late finish, and then we start working backwards with subtraction. So the forward pass is addition, the backward pass is subtraction. The algorithm is a very simple algorithm of adding and subtracting that all the software programs utilize. So 36 minus four gives us 32. The late start, the latest this activity can start is 32 days. That's gonna now be able to be, where they diverge going backwards, be able to be popped into late finish, late finish, and late finish, where they diverge. So you're gonna see that 32 is gonna go in here, the 32 is gonna go in the middle activity, and the 32 is gonna go in the bottom activity. Then we're gonna to continue to follow through and we're going to subtract. So we're gonna do 32 minus six is gonna give us 26. 32 minus 14 is gonna give us 18. And 32 minus four is gonna give us 28. So those numbers are gonna plop in there. And then this 26 becomes the late finish over here. Minus seven gives us 19. Now we've got merging activities again. We got them here and we've got them over here. And when we do the backward pass, as you recall, uh, from the chapter, you take the uh, smaller number going backwards. We took the larger number, if you recall, when we went forward over here. Remember when we did the forward pass, we took the larger number, which was 18. And there, out of the 18 and 15, well, now we're going backwards. So here we have in the backward pass, uh, we have 18 here, and we have uh, 28 over here as the late start. So we're gonna take the smaller number. We're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna take the smaller number. And over here, uh, we have 18 and we have 19. So again, the smaller number in both these examples happens to be 18. So if we take the 28 and the 18, we're gonna use the 18. It's gonna go into the late finish. And the same thing goes up above. We're gonna take basically the 18, it's the smaller number. And then we're gonna do some subtraction. 18 minus five is gonna give us 13, and 18 minus eight is gonna give us 10. Uh, and then again, we're gonna do the same thing over here with the smaller number. Uh, so as that plays out, that 10 and the 13 of these two numbers, the 10 is the smaller, so that's gonna move into the late finish here. 10 minus 10 is zero. And again, if the the final late start must equal zero. If it doesn't equal zero, you started with zero, something's wrong, you made a mistake somewhere. So the next thing is to figure out the float. The float is the difference between the finishes or the float is the difference between the starts all the way through. So here, 10 minus 10, zero. Zero minus zero, zero. 18 minus 15, three. 13 minus 10, three. 26 minus 22, four. 19 minus 15, four. 32 minus 28, four. 26 minus two, four. It, they must be the same or else again, some number got mixed up or you did something wrong along the way. So if we follow that all the way through and we do that math, we can see what the float is for each individual activity. Zero, four, four, three, 10 over here, right? And if we follow the zeros all the way through, then we will see, following the zeros of float, that will be our critical path, following that all the way through. So that is, in the nutshell, how we do the forward pass, the backward pass, and how we come up with uh, calculating the critical path. And we do get a good sense that in scheduling software, it's number one, you really have to think it through your project. And I really think the development of a schedule helps you to visualize step by step how this project is going to be built. It forces you to have a vision and to pick apart and break down your project into components. We talked about a work breakdown structure in chapter two. We talked about having a vision and goal setting and 
overall goals for a project in chapter one. And now this is bringing the technical requirements together of how step by step we pull together this project. And we go from beginning to end at the activity level. We're looking at what has to be done before we start something else. That's the formation of the network. And it forces us to think that through and we're actually building our project. So we're making a mental model of how we're going to build the project. And we have to be very conscious that it's easy to make a mistake. It's easy to put a wrong predecessor or a wrong successor when we're entering information to the scheduling software. So as we're reviewing it, we're visualizing it. We also are having some understanding of how the calculations go together. That helps us to visualize what the time frame should be so we have a rough idea what things should be when we actually look at our schedule in the Gantt chart form. We'll have a better understanding and we'll be able to pick up on any minor mistakes that we make or major mistakes that we make and we can correct them as we go. So it is important to be very analytical. Uh, there's an old saying that I like to think about uh, that goes that uh, basically slow is smooth and smooth is fast. So if we take our time, adjust it, think it through, and uh, we do that well, we'll be pretty, we'll have a good even flow to our project. And we do that effectively. We're going to be very, very successful at completing our projects on time, on budget, and to the quality expectations that our clients expect. So I hope you enjoyed this little uh, short uh, lecture on calculating the critical path, and I'll see you next time. Thanks again. Tom Stevenson signing out.